Representative David Schweiker blamed Democrats for continued inflation during House floor remarks on Friday. The Arizona Republican said, quote, The decisions the Democrats here made two years ago, a little less than two years ago, to push out almost $2 trillion in excess spending that set the match on the inflation kindling, you just blew up much of the world. He also referred to inflation as, quote, the biggest modern tax hike. Republicans have continued to hammer President Biden and Democrats over inflation as pocketbook issues remain central to their midterm messaging. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, I'm going to do my best not to sound frustrated and de defeated. I actually do believe there's hope, but somewhere here, and I'm going to show the numbers, I, we've got to figure out some way particularly my brothers and sisters on the left, but even some on my side, to understand what's going on in the math. The math will always win. Um, I have a half an hour here, so I'm going to throw a lot of math, a lot of the facts, but these facts, these facts functionally decide whether this country survives or not. These facts decide whether we're going to have prosperity or not. And the avoidance of math around here, the avoidance of the actual math, the level of cruelty, the level of just viciousness that will make to the poor, the working middle class, to anyone in this country, because the actual economic data that's been flowing through, that flowed through today, is pretty damn ugly. So let's start to deal with some reality on the math. And this board is already out of date. In the next 30 years, CBO, and this is from a couple months ago, says in today's dollars, 30 years from now, we'll have $138 trillion. And the reason I had to do this is the number keeps changing. And this is already out of date. $138 trillion of borrowed money. And Every dime, and this is one of the hard things because we're terrified to tell our voters this, but it's the math, it's the truth. Every dime of this borrowed money, from today's $31 trillion of borrowed to $138 trillion borrowed, is the shortfall in Medicare, is the shortfall in Social Security. It's demographics. And what's terrifying is this Medicare number when health care right now has double, double the inflation rate, double the inflation rate of the rest of the country. So if you're my community, I represent the highest inflation in the continental United States, the, the Scottsdale Phoenix area. We're sitting around 13 percent. And in my marketplace, we're being told 20 plus percent is my medical inflation. This number explodes. How many times this last week have you had anyone come behind these mics and say, I'm terrified what I just did to people trying to head towards retirement. I'm terrified what we've done to the next generation. Because this is reality. This is the math. And just to be a bit on the annoyed side, and this doesn't even have all the spending. President Biden, unified Democrat control, unified control of the left, has been here, what, 18 some months? Congratulations, you added $4.8 to the deficit. Do you remember the campaign rhetoric? Oh, they're going to be responsible. They're going to balance things. $4.8 to the deficit. And here's where the math gets terrifying. And, and I'm just livid that no one's willing to walk behind these microphones and tell the voters the truth, because we need to hand out cash so they vote for us. So they want to cuddle with us and say, oh, we'd like you. Thank you, Mr. Congressman, for funding this, funding that. Here's, this is going to make sense in a moment. End of 2021, we functionally had 0% interest when you did the adjustment for, and here's our inflation, and here's what UST bills when you do the WAM, the weighted average daily. September 22, we're at 3.1. We are now calculating. And this is real interest. So yes, bonds and T-bills are up here, but when you adjust for inflation and the fact we believe the futures are going to continue to go up. And for the next few years, as far as we can see on the current futures market, 
interest rates are two, three, four points higher than the congressional budget's modeling. What does that actually mean? When you actually start to realize that just a marginal change, so let's just do the easiest one. If we're two points higher on what CBO had projected just a few months ago, in just a decade, you're well over 126% of debt to GDP. But it gets crazier. Now remember, what I'm saying here is with inflation, with expectations, with now the speech I did last week where we showed you data after data after data points, the first, the lie from earlier this year, inflation is transitory. It was never transitory. Anyone that said that didn't show up at their economics class. Look at the structural inputs we saw last week. Inflation now is structural, meaning the Federal Reserve is going to have to either bust the labor markets because this place is incapable of doing what's necessary, which is incentivizing savings. And incentivizing, in a big-time way, productivity. Because if you don't make more stuff, and I know it's supply-side, and supply-side is a right-wing, except it's economics, it works. If we don't get more productive as a society, it's, a, it's an economic term. Um, what is it? Oh, yeah, we're screwed. So do understand, under the current CBO projections, current, and this is from months and months ago before they plugged in the inflation data we're in right now, in 30 years, 50% of all tax receipts was just paying interest. Now, most of this is not Republican or Democrat. It's demographics. We got old as a society. But this is our future, and now you put in the crappy fiscal decisions, economic decisions this place has made over the last 18 months, and you start to see what the future actually looks like. And this is from the CBO numbers. And this is CBO data from a year ago. That if we had just a one point, a single percentage point higher mean on U.S. sovereign debt interest rates, in 30 years, 70, 70% 70 of all tax receipts are consumed by just paying back the interest. Not paying down the principal, 70% just paying interest. So. What happens if where we're at right now becomes long term? Because we're right now two points plus on that CBO model. If it were to last 30 years, and I don't believe it will, but if it did, you got to understand, this is from CBO last year. If we ran 2% higher, 2% higher on U.S. sovereign so T-bills, the 10 years, the 30 years, you know, 2% higher, 100%, 100% of the tax receipts of this country go just to pay our interest. Doesn't this scare the crap out of anyone? Is, does anyone here own a calculator with a battery in it? Do you understand that through a whole series of things, and, and I won't tell the story, I have a 12-week-old little boy that just came to us. And yes, my wife and I, we're going to be old parents. But he's 12 weeks. If this is our future, where because we've borrowed so much money, because we've set off inflation, because we've blown up productivity, and I showed last week that productivity per work hour is actually crashing it is falling. The incentives to participate in the labor markets are not working. So we say, well, we have this great unemployment number, except if you actually look at the U6 data and those things, why are there so many millions of young males missing from the workforce? The incentives we should be engaging in to get older Americans to stay in the workforce. What can we do to incentivize that? Because if we don't, this is our future. 100% of all tax receipts 
being consumed just paying back the interest. Not paying down the debt, not paying for government. It's just we basically, we have become, the United States is functionally an insurance company with an army. And the rate we're going, we're not going to be able to pay our insurance benefits. Social Security, Medicare, VA, Indian Health Services. And, 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 and it just drives me to the edge of just anger, the trite, the, 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 the crazy, you know, we're going to talk about anything that we think will motivate our voters or get them to get excited or maybe give us money or this and that, but to tell them the truth on how much trouble we're in. I accept, maybe I'm a heretic. Maybe the job of a member of Congress is don't come behind the, this microphone and tell the public the truth. And I accept these are big numbers. We're talking trillions. Think of this. The shortfall in Social Security over the 65 year. I know that's a long time, but that's actually how you do Social Security. I'm the ranking Republican on Social Security. The shortfall in just Social Security over the next 65 years is $202 trillion. $202 trillion. In functionally a decade, it's out of money. And at that point, you take a 25% cut. We will double the number of our brothers and sisters who are seniors who will be in poverty. How much discussion do you see around here that anyone here cares about people? But we do brilliant virtue signaling. You know, we virtue signal the hell out of this place. And then when it comes to anything requiring a calculator, and all of your phones have a calculator on it, we do what? And I'm going to show this because hopefully this will make sense. I'm going to try to tie in that there are solutions. There's actually things we could be doing. And with the amount of money the left has spent in the last 18 months, if that money had been actually directed to things that actually would have made a difference. Hell, they might be heading towards a majority again. They're not. But we could also have saved the country. And there would be optimism. But instead, we do pandering. We spend our money on basically buying the next generation of votes. So look, this is actually really, really a societal problem, and we need to have an honest discussion about it. And, and this is terrifying. Because members are terrified to come behind these microphones and say anything where the Twitter army is going to attack you. But the 2021 estimate, 37.3 million people, up from 26 million, will have diabetes. I'm going to show you a slide in a moment that we may have doubled in certain areas the number of our brothers and sisters who are obese during the shutdowns, during the COVID shutdowns. Why is this board important? Our estimates from a couple years ago was that diabetes is 33% of all healthcare spending. It is 31% of all Medicare spending. Diabetes and the associated. I represent the population with the second highest diabetes in the United States. It's a tribal community on the side of Scottsdale. You want to meet the misery, come visit. I will introduce you to families that actually are doing okay financially and grandma's feet have been cut off. So the solution in this place is, well, we'll build more diabetic clinics. We'll find ways to help people maintain their misery. And I know I'm going to get crap for this, Body mass index approximately doubled during the shutdowns. We've been trying to dive into why the excess mortality numbers from this last year, and we're trying to do it intellectually honest, intellectually robust, saying, okay, here's our COVID deaths, here's our fentanyl deaths. Come to Arizona, come, come to Phoenix, and see the number of people now living in alleys. Talk to my local police, the number of bodies they're picking up every week who are dying on fentanyl because fentanyl has become so incredibly cheap. We're now the distribution center because the border's wide open. But hey, these are loving, caring, Democrats don't give a damn about the border. But 
understand the misery. But this just hit us saying, oh God, what happens in society if we just doubled obesity in the country? We know what this means. And we also know that diabetes in the previous model was 33% of all healthcare spending. We know this health index, you know, lots of folks gaining weight during the time we were locked in because that was the brilliance, just the brilliance of this government. How many people have we made sicker, more miserable? Maybe that's the reason those young people. Maybe that's the reason those people aren't in the workforce. Maybe that's the reason productivity isn't working. It's a unified theory. You know, health, immigration, um, technology, all these things come together to make this country healthy. And the reality, we're in trouble. We're in just real trouble. The debt is exploded. Now the interest on that debt has exploded. And the elements where we say, well, we're going to cut. Or is, look, the Democrat mantra is, well, rich people don't pay enough taxes. I've shown boards after boards after boards. You can take every dime they have, and you functionally don't cover a, but a fraction of the crushing debt is coming. And Republicans have their sin. We'll say, it's waste and fraud. Well, turns out waste and fraud and foreign aid are just a fraction. They need to be fixed. They're all things that probably should be fixed. They're part of the formula. So think of the cash the left spent on some of their legislation on giving cash to the big pharma that make insulin Instead of doing something, it would have been much more brilliant. Hey, not too many miles from D.C. here in Virginia, there's a co-op that's actually about to make, I think it is eight types of generic insulin, and they're going to make it less than the subsidized price. Why wouldn't you pass legislation saying, we're going to bring that online, we're going to do the things to incentivize this type of um, working together, and by the way, this is how you bring entries into the market because the additional competition is what lowers price. But instead, the brain trust around here says, eh, we hate big pharma. Hey, here's a bunch of cash. Here's billions of dollars. That was the Democrat solution. And it was fascinating how many groups actually wanted the cash, much more than they wanted the competition, because this place is always about the money. So something I've been trying to pitch here to at least, maybe it won't work. Maybe it's just too utopian for this place to get their heads around. But I think we now have a half a dozen Americans who've been cured of type 1 diabetes. I did a whole function, 40 minutes here on the floor of a couple months ago, walking through the process of the stem cell to being tagged with CRISPR so the body doesn't see it as foreign, so you can do it in a biofoundry, so you can make lots of this, and then it, you know, putting it in the body and the islet cells actually start to attach and it produces insulin. Why wouldn't you put a fortune into bringing this and seeing if it works? The Operation Warp Speed, the Democrats can call it anything they want because this is moral. This is actually loving and kind. And if you look at the previous slides, you understand we have a debt avalanche, and now the interest on that debt avalanche, about to crush us. We need our brothers and sisters to be healthy and able to participate in the economy. And there's some fascinating things we've been working on showing that, hey, income inequality, why is this population poor over here? And we would always get from our brothers and sisters on the left, well, it's racism. It's education. Well, it turns out it's a hell of a lot more complicated. It turns out if you start to actually dig into the data, you actually start to see health. Health. And the fact that crime and people break your bones and steal your stuff. But health was an incredibly large component of why some of these urban populations, my tribal populations, weren't participating in the economy, and it was diabetes. The commonality of diabetes in these populations. So why wouldn't this be everything? We're going to take on the farm bill and make it so we can help our brothers and sisters in type 2 get healthy. And yes, it will take time, and it will be controversial, and it will be difficult. 
But if this is the modern plague, when you saw the numbers of the growth of diabetes, why wouldn't we throw everything we have at it? Because from a math standpoint, it's singularly the most important thing you and I could do for U.S. sovereign debt. Think of that. It's crazy. But if 31% of all Medicare spending is diabetes, and that number is about to grow substantially because of what we've done the last couple of years, and Medicare is 75% of all the future debt, da-da, the math doesn't take a brain surgeon. So let's actually start to walk through more of the things that are actually optimistic and hopeful. And maybe when Republicans are the majority here, we'll actually have the confidence to try to do hard, complicated things that actually make people's lives better. So I, I just pulled this up as just a thought experiment, except for the fact the product actually exists today. It's functioning a home biopsy. You can get this, have it on your shelf at home. You can actually, it actually will be functioning a laboratory where you can put some saliva on it, some other body fluids, and it calculates, talks to the phone, talks to the algorithm, and gives you diagnosis, and it'd be on your home. It would crash, help crash parts of the healthcare. Now, this technology is substantially illegal if you allow the algorithm to write a, a script in this country. And we also know that healthcare costs are with the things that are about to crush us. You would think that this place would be contemplating what can we do in the technology disruption. But instead, with the brain trust here, somehow thinks, well, the ACA, Obamacare. No, that was a financing bill. You got to understand, and the Republican alternative was one, and Medicare for all, they're financing bills. And who gets to pay? Who gets to, su who's subsidized? Medicare for all is just everyone subsidized. Those are financing bills. They have nothing to do with what, with what we pay. This is one of the ways you disrupt the cost of health care. But I believe this place is terrified because you just took, what, hospitals are the largest lobbyists here in Washington, D.C. They should love and embrace these types of technology disruption. We're just afraid to have that conversation with them. Other things. And this is actually one of my pieces of legislation. Just a simple idea. What is inflation? Let's first go back to our, 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 our high school economics class. Inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods and services. OK. We can make more stuff. And that's part of my argument, is get the tax code, get the regulatory codes, um, things we did in the 2017 tax reform with expensing, where we had that productivity spike because investments and things that made the society more productive, meaning you could pay people more. The other side is also too many dollars. How do I get my brothers and sisters to say, don't take that cash that's sitting in your checking account and go buy another big screen television? What if this place would give an incentive, saying take that cash and go put it in your retirement account? Believe it or not, it accomplishes much of the same thing. And, and we've gotten some nice write-ups on the piece of legislation um, Congressman Donalds from Florida and I are doing that says, let's provide an incentive for people to take excess cash instead of spending it in the marketplace, continuing the inflationary cycle, put it in retirement security. But instead, Congress seems absolutely content on letting the Federal Reserve blow up the economy. You already see what's happening around the world. When the United States has inflation, and we start to raise our interest rates, and money comes screaming in from the world, and the US dollar spikes up, and the other currencies in the world collapse, and yet they need to buy fuel and food in US dollars. Understand the decisions the Democrats here made two years ago, a little less than two years ago, to push out almost $2 trillion in excess spending that set the match on the inflation kindling you just blew up much of the world. There, this time next year, there will be countries around the world that can't make their debt payments. You think we'll hear anyone on the left actually come behind the microphone and say, we screwed up. We didn't show up at our economics class. We just blew up the world. Because you did it to my community. I have 13% inflation in the Phoenix Scottsdale area. If you work 
and you haven't had a pay raise. You've lost a month and a half of your wages. A month and a half of your wages. If that isn't, A, the biggest modern tax hike, I tried to explain this last week. Who are the winners and losers in inflation? Well, society, people that save money, that young couple that's trying to save to get their family going, the retired couple, you are crushed. Who's the biggest debtor in the world? This place. We have $31 trillion of borrowed money. And guess what? We now get to pay back that $31 trillion, or at least the interest on it, with deflated dollars, with cheaper dollars because we lowered your economics, but we made it cheaper for us to do. That's one of the reasons why there's this sort of whisper here in Washington, particularly in the Treasury type folks, that say inflation's horrible. But at least in the short term, Democrats are almost giddy that, hey, by the end of the year, the debt to GDP in real dollars will actually close. And it's not because they did anything to grow the economy. It's because the dollar value has crashed because of inflation. You know, the value of the debt, because you're paying it back with deflated dollars, that debt to GDP in real dollar terms will close. Now, the, the punchline is a year or so from now when we've had to sell the new bonds at the higher interest rates and the higher interest rates and the higher interest rates, it moves against us. And that's like those slides I told you where if we had long-term interest rates, 2% over CBO model, it's 100%, 100% of all tax receipts go to pay just interest. This is where we're heading. Shouldn't this be the number one conversation this place is the survival of the country? The survival of my new little boy? But it doesn't give a damn. Because it's math and our voters, let's face it, our voters want the shiny object because it's our fault, because we're terrified to have a conversation with our voters saying, if we don't do these things, we can't save Medicare. We can't save Social Security. Um, that becomes the attack ad. And we do it to each other. I believe Democrats are much more duplicitous in it. But math is scary and doesn't need to be. There is hope. And look, I just bring this one up because this was in a recent article talking about some of the productivity effects, the GDP growth effects, when we got the parts of the tax code right. And we didn't get everything we should have. But I need you, if you want a real living example, look at the fourth quarter of 2017, because remember the fourth quarter of 2017 it got the benefit of expensing even though the tax reform didn't finish until the end of 2017, but we did that retrospective. And then look at 2018, look at 2019. The shrinkage of in income inequality. The poor got much less poor. The working middle class had some of the most a couple of their most prosperous years in modern history. African-American females had this amazing growth in wages and job opportunities. But it's a demonstration. I know it's heresy for the left to complement tax reform. It wasn't tax cuts. It was tax reform. Because the actual receipts, the revenues that came in, the number of times our friends on that side said, you're going to put us into depression. I'm waiting for my apology because we actually took in more money. Corporate receipts went up. Thank God we had actually that robust of an economy, that robust of a tax system when the pandemic hit. Could you imagine if we didn't? How miserable we would have been? The last thing. Just, 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 and this is not meant to be a non sequitur. It's actually to be more a closing on the discussion of the misery. I'm a border state. I know most of the Democrat votes aren't anywhere near the border states, so you don't give a damn about us. But I'm dead serious. I have some of the, uh, I'm blessed. I have just an amazingly wonderful congressional district. It's where I grew up, it's my home. It's my obligation to try to defend them even neighborhoods that don't vote for me, come drive with me. Come see the misery that's living in the alleys behind these houses. Fentanyl has crashed 
in price in the Phoenix area. I have a, a Phoenix police sergeant who's my neighbor, and he was telling me a year or two ago, $100, $120 to get high for the day. Today it's like 12 And now we are finding a new form of synthetic opioid crossing our border. It is 10 times more potent than fentanyl. Okay, maybe you don't give a damn about people in the Southwest or the misery of the little 14-year-old girl that just died down the way from me taking one pill. But when this stuff gets left on a countertop somewhere at your favorite wine bar and everyone in the room is dead, Will the left take serious the misery that the open border policies have brought to us? Look, my pitch is really simple. The economics are all screwed up. The Democrats set off inflation. That piled on the debt, piled on our demographics, piled on our health care. We're in real trouble as a nation. If we would embrace the disruptions of technology and the incentives for productivity, we can at least bend the curve. We're not going to pay down the debt, but we can bend it so that debt to GDP is survivable. But you got to get the other policies right. And this place is having no conversations that are actually serious, honest, and important. And I don't know how this became Republican versus Democrat. We're now just talking the survival of our republic. And with that, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back.